Good morning. Welcome to our Bible study this morning. This morning we'll be looking at part number 10 of our 13 part series on the precious Word of God. This morning we'll be trying to answer a question that might be the most asked question by mankind over the centuries. Here's the question. What is the purpose for my life? Why do I exist? Is there a purpose for my existence? Is there a purpose for my life? Is there a role that I am to play? Or is all of this around me, including my own life, simply a happenstance? Simply an accident that has no purpose or meaning behind it? Okay, that's our question. That's what we'll be trying to answer in today's lesson. Now, in our lesson today, we're going to only be looking at one section of scripture. And let me just explain something. Uh, the scripture, let me give it to you, is Ecclesiastes 12, verses 12 through 14. Ecclesiastes 12, 12 through 14. Ecclesiastes is one of the poetical books. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. So while you turn to Ecclesiastes 12, let me just say this. <clears throat> the reason why I'm only using one text is not because... The Bible only addresses the meaning to life in one section of Scripture. It addresses it throughout the Bible. But here in Ecclesiastes 12, I believe we find a full and complete answer to the question, why are we existing on earth? What is the purpose of our life? What's the meaning to my life? However you want to look at it. So in this short section of Scripture, we have the, the entire answer to our question found here. And I'll tell you why that is. The book of Ecclesiastes was written by King Solomon. Solomon was given godly wisdom to rule the nation of Israel. But, as the example of his life pointed out and also as scripture points out, he wasn't given wisdom to lead his family. And you'll see that Solomon, if you study his life, during the course of his life Solomon made many mistakes when it came to his family matters. So he was one of the wisest men alive when it came to ruling over his nation. But when it came to family matters and personal issues, he didn't know it all by any means. One of the things that troubled Solomon was he did not understand the meaning to his life. And he was questioning, why was I put on this planet? Where can I find happiness and where can I find joy and what's life all about? And so as we study the book of Ecclesiastes, it's like a diary that Solomon wrote. And during Solomon's entire lifetime, Solomon sought the answer to the true meaning to his life. As you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you'll find during the course of Solomon's pursuit for the true meaning to life, he tried many, many different things. And believe me, King Solomon was the ideal, ideal one to do this because he had... He probably had more wealth than anybody else in the world at that time. So he had the money to try anything he wanted to. You know, most common people like you and I, and especially people back in those days, they were poor people. And so they had very little money to be able to just extravagantly try, you know, do whatever they want to do in life. Most of us just can't do that because we're limited financially, not Solomon. He was king over Israel and he had more money than he knew what to do with so when it came to him trying something, he always had the opportunity to try whatever he wanted because he had so much power and so much wealth, he could just do like that and he would have what he wanted. So as you read through Ecclesiastes, you find he tried a tremendous amount of different things to see, is this what life is really all about? Try things like the arts and the sciences. He tried the idea of education. He tried the idea of different worldly pleasures. He tried wealth and riches. He tried power, political power. He tried philosophy. He tried uh, many different things to try and see what's the true meaning to life. And so as you read through Eccle Ecclesiastes, you're going to see this is a diary he wrote of all the things he tried in life to see if he can come up to life's true meaning. It wasn't until just a few years before the end of his life that he finally found the true answer to life's meaning. Most people believe Ecclesiastes 12 was written just a few years before Solomon died. 
almost everybody agrees at least he was an old man when he wrote Ecclesiastes 12. Whether he was how close to his death this was, they're not certain, but they believe it was within a few years. But in any case, the idea was Solomon took almost all of his life trying to come to a conclusion about what the true meaning to life on earth is all about. He found the answer, and for our benefit, he recorded that answer in Ecclesiastes 12, verses 12 through 14. So, folks, that's what we're going to look at exclusively. What is the true meaning to our life on earth? Look at Ecclesiastes 12 and verse number 12. And further, by these, my son, be admonished. So he says, by all these writings in the book, learn from them. Apply them to your life so you don't have to go through this long process of trying to find the truth like I did. He said, I wasted my life trying to find the true answer to the meaning to life. You don't have to. He said, take these writings that I put in my book of Ecclesiastes and be admonished. In other words, be warned by them. And learn from them so you don't have to waste your life. You can live your life knowing what life is all about if you simply apply the truths from this book to your life. So he says, by these, my son, be admonished. Of making of books, there is no end. Solomon said, if people wanted to write books trying to explain the true meaning to life, he said, there's no end to them. And folks, we see that in today's time. You look at all the different books out there about different people's philosophies about what life is all about and how to have true happiness. You got philosophical books. You got the theological books. You have different counseling type of books, you know, self-help books, self-improvement books. You've got all sorts of different people giving you their idea on the meaning to life and how to live a fulfilled profitable life. Solomon says, when it comes to this subject of the true meaning to life, making in many books, there is no end to it. So he said, if you think that it's simply a matter of just picking up one book and reading it, apart from his now, but I'm saying just in general, the books that are out there, he read all sorts of books apparently about this. He read all sorts of different uh, writers who philosophers and all from his day who were commenting on the true meaning of life. He said there's no end to it. He said you can end up reading until you turn blue in the face. He said that's why I'm writing this one book for you to make it easy for you to come to an understanding because there's so many things out there. You can read this stuff till you die and still not come to the truth. The making of many books there is no end and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Solomon says it'll wear you out. He said, if you live your life in search of the true meaning to life, it will wear you out. He said, it'll be a very much a disappointment because you'll try over and over different things and you'll find that nothing seems to give real meaning to, life, to your life. You'll think, oh, this is it. You know, if I only have. How many times have you heard that, by the way? Let's say when it comes to possessions, you know, somebody say, if I only had this one thing, I'd be content and I'd be happy. And that would be my purpose in life is to get that one thing. And sure enough, if they try hard enough, and if they live their life for that thing, chances are good they'll get it, whatever that thing is. Once they get that thing, it doesn't last long at all. And they're saying, you know what? It's this thing over here. If I had that along with what I've already gotten, then I'll be happy. Like Solomon said, much studies of weariness of the flesh. He says, man, he says, you can study this thing. You can experience all these things in life and it'll only depress you because you'll never find the true meaning to life. He said, look, I, it took me my whole life to come to the conclusions that I finally came to. So here Solomon is clearly telling us in verse number 12, the need to listen to what he says so that we don't have to go through all the agony and waste our entire life trying to find its meaning and its purpose. He goes on then. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Okay, Solomon says, everything I've written to you in this book, in the previous 11 chapters, he said, I'm going to summarize it in this verse, in two verses. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to give you the conclusion to this whole issue. He said, here's the conclusion of the whole matter. Now notice he says for us specifically to hear it. He says, hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Now what did Solomon mean by hearing it? 
and he, and it is at this point we need to be careful so we understand exactly what he's saying. Folks, there's a different way to hear things. Let me just run this by you real quickly. We can hear something with our ears. What that simply means is we can hear a truth and we can understand it mentally without ever applying it to our life. We can hear it with our minds. That means we can come to a knowledge of something. We can recognize it's truthful. We can think it through and come to the conclusion, you know, this is the right answer. But again, if we still don't apply it, we're still lacking. We could hear something with our hearts. When you hear something with your heart, that means you have the mental knowledge and you do think it through. You come to see that it is the truth and that it's important. But then you take it a step further. When you hear something with your heart, you actually apply it then to your life. That's what the Bible calls wisdom. Whenever you read about something that's wisdom, it means when you hear a truth, you think it through and you acknowledge, you come to an understanding, yeah, this thing is the truth. And then you actually apply that truth to your life. When Solomon says, hear the conclusion of the whole matter, folks, I have no doubt in my mind he's talking about hearing with our hearts. Listen, if we just hear with our ears or if we just hear it with our minds and we never apply it to our lives, it'll do us no good. What's the purpose in knowing what life is about if we don't apply that truth to our life? So when Solomon says, hear the conclusion of the whole matter, I believe without a doubt what he's saying is, come to an understanding of these truths. Come to a knowledge of them. Come to an understanding of them. Think it through. Understand why these things are so. But don't stop there then. We should apply them to our life. Okay, he goes on. Okay, Solomon, here it comes. What is the true meaning to life? Two things. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. Fear God. What does Solomon mean by fearing God? The word fear carries with it the idea of reverence. We should reverence God. We should understand how great he is and how insignificant we are compared to him. If we truly reverence God, that brings about a humility to our heart and to our spirit. It also brings about and acknowledgement that we need God for everything in life because without him we can do nothing. That's all a part of this idea of fear. Another aspect of fear is this. Submission to his commands. When we really fear God like we should, we will be in submission to his will and his way for our life. We'll want to know, Lord, what do you want me to do for you? And then in response, we'll also want to do what he wants for us. That's showing a true reverence for God and a true fear of God. Finally, the idea of fear also has the idea of distress. Now, this might seem like a different aspect toward the Lord, but just stop and think it through. When we say we are to fear God, we're to reverence him, we're to submit to him, and finally... We are to be in distress. Now, folks, let me explain something. And this is the best way I know how to explain the idea of being in distress when we fear God like we should. When I was younger, <clears throat> and my dad would give me, tell me what I needed to do. Okay, like he wanted me, let's say, to paint the fence. Folks, I'll tell you. A part of me painted the fence because I did love my dad, and I just wanted to please him. That was a part of it. I really did. I mean, I liked to please my parents. It made me feel good when they looked at what I did and they would say, you know, good job, Rob. Thank you for doing it. You did a great job. That type of thing. I enjoyed receiving that type of praise. So a part of why I obeyed my dad was, number one, I loved him. Number two, I did want to receive praise and I wanted to please him. But there's a third part too. Folks, I knew if I didn't paint that fence, he would be ticked. Now, my dad wasn't much of a one for spanking us kids. But he did discipline us kids. And I knew that there would be some type of discipline coming if I didn't paint that fence. Now, folks, let me tell you, with a Christian, there is no difference. 
if we have knowledge of God's will for our life and we choose on purpose to rebelliously say no to that, there is discipline. He will chasten us to bring us back to him and to bring us back to his will. And let me tell you something, folks. If you as a Christian know God's will and you on purpose say no, and if no discipline comes, that's a sign you're not a child of God to start with. Now let me explain this one more time. If you know what he wants for your life, and if you on purpose, rebelliously, you say, no, I will not do it. And if you don't feel the chastening hand of God in your life someplace along the line, that's a sign you've never been saved. Because any father that loves their children, he will discipline them if they don't do what's right. That's the type of distress, I believe, is brought out here when it says to fear God. It doesn't mean to shake in our shoes thinking we'll lose our salvation and go to hell. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with realizing, look, if I'm one of God's children, he will bring me back to him. He will chasten me lovingly like a father would chasten a son to bring me back into do what's right. Okay. Not only should we fear God, but Solomon says the other purpose in our life is to keep his commandments. That means to come to an understanding of what his commandments are and then apply them to our life. And to hold them dear to us, to keep them. So, just like when it comes to being pulled over because you're speeding and you say, I didn't know what the speed limit was and what's the response? Ignorance is no excuse. I'll tell you with the Lord, that's so too. Ignorance is no excuse. You know, as Christians, what we could say is this. I'm never going to read the Bible. I'm never going to study it. That way I won't know God's will for my life. Therefore, I won't be held accountable to do it because I don't know it. it doesn't work that way. To keep his commandments involves finding out what he wants for us. Putting them into action in our life and then keeping them in our life. Not just, you know, living it out for a month and then turning back to our old ways and forgetting about it. But it's continuing on keeping his commandments. That's the idea behind keep his commandments. Solomon made it plain. What's the purpose in life? We should be the servants of our Lord. What's the purpose in our life? We should glorify the Lord here on earth in the eyes of others. What's the purpose in our life? To be shining trophies of God's grace. So when people look at us, they can say, What a gracious Lord he serves. Look at all that he's done. See, that's what our purpose in life is. But Solomon goes on. He helps us to understand that sometimes we need an added push. Just because we know... The purpose in life, that doesn't mean that we're going to just automatically do it. We need a push. Well, he pushes us here in verse number uh, 13, I believe it is, or 14, 14. For God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Solomon goes on and says, by the way, don't forget, we'll have to stand and answer before the Lord concerning have we fulfilled the purpose in our life? We're going to have to answer, stand and answer to before the Lord. What have we done with our life here on earth? Even as Christians. Remember, standing before the Lord in judgment isn't simply for lost mankind. Certainly lost mankind will stand before the Lord and they'll be judged. And when they are found that they are lacking, when their names are not written in the book of life, and when that's found out, they will then be consigned to the lake of fire for an eternity. Revelation and many other places in the Bible are clear about that. But folks, there's <clears throat> the judgment of God involves saved people as well. How will the, the judgment of God concerning saved people be? Well, it says here, he will bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Every work that we do will be judged. Every work. What will be the basis of that judgment? Did it comply to the will of God or not? 
What were the motives behind what that was done? That's the secret things. What were the motives? Why did you do what you do? You know, folks, outward conformity to the commands of God done with the wrong motive are worthless. I've known people, for example, who have attended church, not because they wanted to glorify and worship God. They attended church because maybe their girlfriend said, I won't go out on a date with you unless you attend church. So when they stand before the Lord, he said, but Lord, I went to church. He's going to say, wait a minute, let's look at the secret things. The secret thing was this. You didn't attend church to worship me and to honor me and to reverence me. You attended church because that little girl that you wanted to date, she wouldn't date you unless you went to church. Take, for example, if we do a, is something else good, we help our neighbor, let's say. Oh, here's one. Okay, let me, let me use this one. Let's say we, we donate money to a charity. It's a good charity. I mean, one that gets the gospel message out as well as helping the physical needs of those in this community. We give a big lump sum. We stand before the Lord. Remember that big lump sum I gave to that charity back then to get the gospel out and to help others around, you know, whether it's a local church or some other charity. Remember that what I did? He says, yeah, wait a minute. Let's look at the motives. Did you do it because you love me? Did you do it because you wanted to help your neighbors and you saw that they had spiritual needs? Amen. If you did, praise the Lord, you're going to receive eternal rewards for that. But if you gave money so you could then turn around and have your picture in the paper, Joe Smo, he gave $10,000 to our local charity. Way to go, Joe. If that was the motive in our hearts why we gave the money, it's worthless in God's sight. So see, that's what Solomon means by every secret thing. He's saying not just our outward actions, but what took place in our heart when we did that action is important as well. God shall bring every work into judgment and every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. For a lost person, what's going to happen? Your name is not found written in the, in the book of life. Therefore, we know you're consigned to the lake of fire. We now look at your works and we realize you've done these different evil, wicked things. They were not covered by the shed blood of Christ. So your consignment to the lake of fire will be determined by your sinful actions. So the level of punishment in the lake of fire you will receive will be based on that for the lost person. And let me tell you, any any level of of Punishment in the lake of fire is a horrible, horrible thing. I don't mean to minimize any level in the lake of fire, but I do believe there are different punishments for different sins that mankind will have to eternally face if they're not saved. For the saved person, what's going to happen? Rob, your name is found in the book of life. Therefore, we know you're not going to the lake of fire. You're going to spend eternity with me. Rob, here we see these times when you failed me. You, you had op opportunities that you missed. These other opportunities, you outwardly did what you were supposed to do, but your heart was wrong when you did it. You're going to lose rewards for those. You could have gotten so many rewards you lost. But Rob, here you have these other works that you did with the right motive. Your heart was right when you did it, and you did what I wanted you to do. You will be rewarded for those. Then I'll be able to take those rewards and lay them back on my Lord's feet and say, Lord, I don't deserve these rewards because it was only because of you that I did these good things. It's only because you physically created me. It's only because you saved me. It's only because you gave me this gift of the Spirit. It's only because you showed me your will. It's only because you gave me the needed graces to perform that will. Lord, everything goes back to you. So even though I have these crowns of rewards, I'm laying them back at your feet, praising you and saying, praise God. You might say, well, if that's so, then what's the big deal about rewards if you can't keep them? Folks, it'll be a privilege to be able to lay them back at the Lord's feet. That's why we want the rewards, to be able to say, Lord, that's my one way I can praise you and honor you. It's one of many ways throughout eternity I'll be able to say, thank you for all you've done for me. So I want as many rewards as I can so I can give him the greatest thanks I can because of all he's done. Folks, how do we as Christians receive the greatest number of rewards to lay back at his feet by understanding the true meaning to life to fear god and to keep his commandments that's the whole of man that's it that's our duty folks that's the meaning to life and if we can say at our hearts that we are fearing god and keeping his commandments 
we can say that we are doing exactly what our Lord wants us to do. We're fulfilling the purpose for which we were created, to glorify and honor Him in the eyes of others. Lord willing, folks, in our next uh, lesson, we're going to be asking the question, why is there sorrow, pain, and tragedy in the world? Thank you for joining me with me in this time of Bible study.